Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Gain, Grow, Retain. For today, we've got Jennifer Kirkland from Conversica. She leads CS operations and has a ton of experience within account management, product management, and really just within B2B SaaS. We enjoyed the conversation as we got to dive into how she really thinks about making the customer success team great at what they're doing and how she sees that as her job as the CS ops leader. And she really thinks about the, the change management aspect heavily at the organization. You know, how do you go about changing a process or looking at adopting metrics and how do you get momentum within the organization to make that happen? So uh, we enjoyed the, the conversation with Jennifer and hope you all enjoyed as well. Welcome to the Game Grow, Retain podcast. Hello, we're joined here today by Jennifer Kirkland. She is currently the VP of Customer Success Operations and Professional Services at Conversica. She's got a diverse background across CS Ops, account management. I think she also had a, a stint in product management, but we're excited to, uh, to be here with Jennifer today and, and dive in. So Jennifer, welcome. And if you don't mind, maybe dive into just what CS Operations and Professional Services looks like at Conversica for you. Yeah, well, first off, I'm really excited to be here today. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, we have a lot going on when it comes to customer success operations at Conversica. We're kind of a full in-house team. So we do everything from configuring the system to, to help enable our customer success teams. That means setting up our, our Gainsight systems as a platform that we use. Um, we also manage all of our one-to-many customer communications. We do all of our product announcements. Um, we do all of our customer training, customer enablement, and even customer success enablement. So we have a pretty large role. We play with a lot of different teams. Um, our professional services teams kind of branch across a number of departments and rely very heavily on the systems that the CS operations teams build out. So it's, it's a nice, round, robust approach that we take when it comes to servicing our clients. That's great. I think one of the interesting things as we look at, you know, your experiences, especially within deploying software internally for the organization to mm -hmm. use, how do you approach the data element of all the systems? And how do you think about maybe even just the, the technology plan within, with inside the organization? Is there anything that you guys have done in particular to make sure that kind of all the systems are talking to each other and everything is on the same page, especially as it relates to the data points that become important for you know, your CSMs or your executives or whatever it might be. How do you, how did you guys approach that at Conversica? Well, for us, it was pretty easy because it was a foreseen mechanism. Um, when we, <laughs> when I first started at the company almost five and a half, actually over five and a half years ago now, we had Salesforce put in place and it had some of the basic account functions set up, but we didn't have any of the automation about when you're supposed to be contacting people, any of the proactive outreaches. Um, when we started to branch off into our second business area, the system that we had within Salesforce wasn't robust enough to be able to support what we needed. So we essentially built out health scorecards in Google Sheets. So when it came time to where we could get the budget to start evaluating a third party system, we already knew exactly what we needed. We had built out a lot of the automation within Salesforce using workflows. Um, it was working well enough, but it wasn't great. Um, and then we had all of our scorecards that we had built out within Google Sheets where we were doing daily batch uploads of the key metrics that we were identifying, uploading them. It would trickle through all the different related sheets and then voila, there we were. So we knew what we wanted and made evaluating a lot easier. And that's something that I would recommend to anybody is like recognize where your weaknesses are today identify what items you need to solve for, and then figure out what platform is going to help you reach that need. And there are a lot of different products that are out there that are really amazing. Everyone takes a slightly different approach, whether it's a user approach versus an account approach versus metrics approach. Um, so it's just kind of figuring out what's working best for your company and then driving forward with it. We're pretty data heavy, but we also are an extremely high service team. Um, it's a unique product that we have. So we have to talk to our customers a lot. Yeah, we, we yeah. hear, and I love the approach that you mentioned, you know, about figuring out what you needed first. You know, I think we often hear people using spreadsheets within organizations or thinking about just what their current internal process is and then trying to, you know, evolve that from there and figure out what they really need. I think another area that we hear consistently, and I'm just curious, again, just the approach that, that you took is how did you think about budgeting for a system 
and how did you kind of think about that plan as you maybe looked out, you know, two to three years? Uh, I think, you know, there's a couple of approaches we've heard, you know, one organization we talked to looked at it from a growth perspective. So they said, hey, this, this technology platform is really going to help us grow our revenue or grow our accounts. I think another perspective we heard from an organization is, hey, this is going to help us mitigate churn. It's really going to make sure that we're a proactive team and we can just look at the renewals and the retention um, as our outcome. But I'm curious if, if those two approaches were something that you guys looked at in terms of budgeting and, and how you just thought about the kind of the growth plan with the technology and, and looking at how the CSM team was going to be built out further and even the, the professional services team. Yeah, it was, it was a combination of both. It, it, it leaned much more heavily on the retain side of the equation. Um, we saw that there was an opportunity to improve churn, a pretty large opportunity to improve churn by increasing our touch points, by speaking to our customer about the right things at the right time. So what we lacked at the, at the time was the consistency in the team reaching out the awareness of if they were actually executing on that and even more so were they talking about the right things like how confident were we that they were saying the right items and that they weren't just talking about the most recent football scores especially around fantasy football time right <laughs> um, it, it was shocking we heard it a lot <laughs> it's like oh, oh well, how's your team go um which is fun it's a good part to have in your relationship but that shouldn't be the the sole reason why you're talking to your customer so yeah. we we really did focus on the retention side of the equation like we knew that they weren't getting contacted we knew that they weren't getting the right information sent to them at the right time and so we were evaluating what products would enable us to do that at scale and we do own customer communications within customer success operations. So we do our product analysis, as I said, we do our NPS surveys, we do all of the marketing emails that we send out to our customers um, in regards to what might be coming up or different events. So those are all a really heavy piece into the equation. Um, at the time, you mentioned in here um, growth and expansions. We were doing it, but it wasn't part of our responsibility set, but we wanted it to be because we knew it was something that we would be able to execute on well. We're having the conversations every day. You guys are aware that like customer success managers are the most in touch person with their clients or they should be. Um, so you know what they need. You have their best interests in heart. You want to make sure that they stay. You want to make sure that they continue to use and see value on your product. You're not going to oversell them. Um, so you know what the right size is. So that was our secondary benefit that we layered on. It was a, hey, once we get our house cleaned up, here's what we're going to be able to do. And it's going to enable the sales team to focus on um, new business and to drive new bookings and to drive new revenue, which we would then be able to put into our machine and then grow down the road. So that is the method that we took when it came to identifying um, that there was a budget need for a system and a platform. Jen, that's awesome. And so do your, do the CSMs at Conversica, do they own revenue? Then do they own the renewal and the upsell components so that your, your, your sales team can focus exclusively on new logo? We do. Yeah. We made that change when I was still overseeing the department. Um, I moved over into customer success operations during my tenure at Conversica. I started off in customer success, um, leading the teams there. Uh, so yeah, so we made that transition once we got our retention to the point where we really wanted it to be focused on and we drive our own book of business and we grow our own. Uh, if it does branch over into like referrals or over into new business teams, we will loop in sales. We still partner with them regularly. They're still our friends and our allies. Um, but yeah. for the most part, the smaller, Hey, did you know that this assistant can help you out? We'll, we'll execute on that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. There's so many, I, I want to go down a rabbit hole with you on that, but I won't right now. Um, the, the <laughs> one thing that you, you talked about as we were warming up here was the way that you treat, um, you, you really treat what you do from an operational perspective as you, you use the words product manager. You act like a product manager mm -hmm. in terms of how you, uh, you know, identify initiatives, you know, put them in place, build process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is a really good analogy. And I know you touch a lot of different groups with what you do there. So can, explain that a little bit because it was a really cool concept. Yeah. And it comes back from my experience, right? I was a product manager for a long part. I led a number of different teams and it's a passion of mine. For some reason, I have this crazy skill 
or maybe it's not a skill. Maybe it's a weakness. <laughs> Some people have told me it's a weakness where if I see a problem, I just see all the different ways that it could be addressed from multiple directions. Um, I kind of like to make an analogy of it's like a lighthouse, right? Like I see this like beacon in the light. I know that that's where land is. I can't see anything else around it, but I know all the different paths that we can go. And I just want to choose which path I can use to get there. So when it comes to approaching customer success that way, I, I know that it takes so many different parts. It takes a team, right? It takes a small army. You really want to make sure that you identify those regular frequent items that customers needs have are and try to make sure that you're getting that information and getting that support out to them quickly um, and making it easy for them to access it. So that's kind of where your tech support team kind of rolls in. You see that your customers are having challenges adopting your product because it's so new to the market. It's nothing that they've ever dealt with before. So you really want to kind of try to solve for enabling your customer success managers to help solve those problems for them. So scoping out the, the, what are the different touch points? What are all the different features or like strategic rollout points that you need to have within your customer success operations system or product per se is really important. Like this is what we need here. Here's where the customer needs to be serviced. Here's where our CSMs need to be serviced. And I think that that's one of the things that has really helped us grow quickly from an operations perspective is thinking about your internal teams as your customer. Your customer is obviously your customer, but your internal teams are your customers yeah. too. Yeah, Sales is absolutely. our customer. CSMs are our customers. Tech support, professional services, everybody is. Um, because ultimately you want your CS ops system to be the heartbeat of, yeah. of the platform and of your, your process. Yeah, we always say that you know, there, there are two kinds of people in any SaaS company. It's either somebody is servicing the customer directly or it's somebody servicing the people who are servicing the customer directly, but you shouldn't really ever be mm -hmm. any further, you know, any, any further removed from the customer than that. I really like that yep. mindset. So can you, let's yeah. get brass tacks for a second. Can you talk about maybe a, a process or something that you've had to put in place recently, if you can, um, where, you know, you had to not only you think about what the process was going to be, but also go drive the change. Cause that is a big part of what we deal with. And a lot of the companies we work with is just, you know, half of this is just a people process, right? I mean, this is a people business, even though it's mm -hmm. software. Um, so like, do you have some good examples of where you've, where you've implemented change and you know, from top to bottom, not only just the systems, but the, 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 the training and the understanding why we're making a change and, you know, why it's okay and, and what the impacts were and all that kind of stuff. Do you have any examples from recent history that would be useful for people to hear? So many. Um, I figured. Yeah. So, yeah, I say so many. We're, we're going through our second, third, fourth, I don't even know what number we're on iteration of how we're using the system. So first round, we did our MVP. We just did a single scorecard. We had a single approach for using CTAs and for using success plans. Um, for those who aren't very used to Gainsight lingo, that's just the automation of when you reach out, how you reach out and what you say. Um, so we're doing our second iteration and with it, we rolled out an entirely new approach to how we're going to be onboarding our customers. And when I say new approach, the technology doesn't change. The documentation isn't really changing. It's just a who speaks to the customer at what point and how you're going to be working with them and servicing them. And that undertaking was really exciting because it touched on so many different teams. Sales needs to be aware of it because they need to be able to speak to it. Your customer success managers need to learn the new ways that are going to be using the system. We actually changed how they were going to be getting notified. We changed what the expectations are with the methods of notification. We put a little bit more in there in regards to, you know, you need to send this email with this content. You can adjust it, but it needs to have this core content um, by this day of the onboarding process. Um, and then looping in our technical account managers who are the technical side of the onboarding process, who are actually going to be more of the project managers to take on a lot more responsibility. Yeah. So that's a I lot think of change. That probably fits in line. Yeah. 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 That's a perfect example. I mean, you moved everybody's cheese there, right? I mean, project managers, CSMs. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's yeah, a lot. we really did. It is a lot, it's the, but I it's think, for the best. I think, I think the other I thing think. that was, was interesting that you mentioned as well is, is also the kind of the concept of an MVP and, and also 
you know, the, the concept that there is iteration and everything that you're doing in the system, it's not a deploy it once and then it's going to work. I think we often walk into conversations where um, companies are looking to deploy a system and they want kind of the big, you know, in one big swoop, we're just going to implement everything all at once. And we're going to, you know, just kind of drop this new system in the lap of everybody. And it's just going to work willy nilly. But I think, you know, it's the, the nearsighted view because, you know, specifically you have to iterate on these things as they go forward. Yeah. You also, the, ch- the change management that comes along with that, you know, just the adoption, the, the um, actual usefulness of the reporting and the metrics. And do we have the right things that we're looking at? Like there's so many variables that come out of this that, you know, just kind of require iteration. So how did you communicate that? Or how did you think about kind of deploying the MVP and then preparing people um, for kind of the iteration and the next steps that you were going to go on? And specifically what I'm curious about in there too is like how did you take the feedback from the frontline CSMs or from your executive team in terms of the reporting and kind of figure out how to prioritize those projects as you're iterating on the system? Uh, I think that, that would be a really interesting evolution to hear about. Yeah, um, I'm going to go behind the curtain a little bit on this and expose um, personal dirty laundry. So when we, when we first started, I was the sole customer success ops person. I don't know if anyone out there can relate to that, but I was the person who was doing all of the configuration. Um, I was setting up all the scorecards. I was doing all of the change management. Um, I had a partner or two within Conversica to help facilitate that within their teams, within their customer success managers, but they, they, their approach to customer success management was much more put people on it. Um, which was a need that we needed at the time. So it was an appropriate focus to have. But what it did do is it, it really did narrow the scope of that initial release from what I wanted it to be. I'm someone who can overcomplicate. I'm someone who wants to just run as fast as I can to that key point. It's not really co- overcomplication because at the end of the day, that's what needs to happen. It's just moving too fast for everybody else um, and not being able to do or be effective at the communicating piece. So, when we launched our MVP, it was great. It was a huge benefit. Everyone loved it. I secretly hated it because I knew that it could have been so much more. So when it came to like launching it and everyone is excited, I was like, okay, whew, I could breathe a little bit now. And it's like, wow, I have these six other features. And when I say features, I'm talking about running the NPS systems, um, doing our product announcements, um, helping to enable our customers by building out a knowledge base which we did not have at all at the time. We had no source of, no Bible per se of what the product does or how it works or best practices. So it was really easy to be like, okay, well now let me do MVP of this. And then now let me do MVP of this. So I got to a world where we had this semi-functional machine that had all of the different arms, but they were all really pretty basic. And at that point, people started to, use the product in a way, the product being the CS operation system. I'm going to probably just say product all the time because that's just how I think about it. Um, They started to use the product (laughs) differently than how it was intended. And they started to go a little bit rogue, which was exciting because it's like, wow, I never thought that people would use it this way. But unfortunately, more people started to go rogue in the other direction where they were just using Excel sheets or just communicating in Slack. They weren't using the system that we had built out to any means. And a lot of that came from the adoption piece. I I talk a lot about how you need to make sure that you're thinking about your product being adopted. It's so critical because as soon as somebody isn't watching it and someone who is responsible for the people who is responsible for using the system is the one that needs to be keeping an eye on it. As soon as that starts to kind of drop off, it's really hard to get back on track, to get back on the rails. So that way you can do the next iteration. So you kind of can get caught in this cycle of a, just use it, just use it, just use it. You'll see the value of it. because you don't want to sink a lot of resources towards like making the next big thing. If people aren't even like engaging with the core baseline, like, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. Except for it was really frustrating. <laughs> and have, have you guys been there? Yeah, You've that's, been the, there before. I was, that's what I was going to say is I think the, you know, I, so at a previous company I rolled out, uh, it was on a much lesser scale, but we were, you know, rolling out a project management tool and, you know, going through that process with, you know, close to 50 people in the organization, it's, you know, even at that, even at that scale, you realize those same things, right? Which is 
you, then you start pressing, Hey, I released this to help you. Why aren't you using it? And you start pressing on like, mm -hmm. you know, why aren't you using it? Uh, I need you to use this tool. And you start instituting uh, almost like metrics or parameters to measure um, before you mm -hmm. even start just asking, you know, what would be useful? How do you need to use this system in your daily life? Like, what is the, you know, how do you get the benefit out of it? And I think starting to ask some of those questions, um, almost to your, what you're saying, you know, from a kind of a product standpoint or product management standpoint, it's kind of getting that curiosity to go in there and ask mm -hmm. some of those questions to realize at the end of the day, like, okay, this is how we should think about this within the context of a CSM's daily life. And here's the way that I need to approach communication to them about why we're updating the process or how the system um, is being built and why it's being built in a certain way. So I do think there is this, there's always this people nuance that you have to think about as you do anything within a business, you know, is just the, the different ways of communication and the different ways that um, people react to technology or process change that you have to go through that I think is always underestimated when you try and roll out a system or roll out a new process or anything. Yeah. yeah. And, and you kind of have to set your ego aside a little bit, right? So you will spend all this time building this thing and you get feedback and people are like, well, I really wish that it could do X, Y, Z. Your first initial reaction is, well, you can, like, this is how you do it. That's how you want to approach it. Well, yeah, you can, this is how you do it. But you have to just step back, put your ego aside, say, listen, like, there's a reason why they're not doing it the way that you think that they should be doing it. And that's what you need to understand. So that way you can execute it the right way. So one of the things that we found is that some of our dashboards that we had, they were really robust. They had a lot of great information. It was really important for the CSM to look at, to see what customers were up for renewal, which customers were at risk for churning, and they just weren't looking at it. Turns out tables are not their preferred view. So you just want to put it into a widget. It's literally the same report, just displayed slightly different. And all of a sudden everyone's eyes lighten up and then voila, you have immediate adoption. Um, you also have buy-in from the team leads because it drives more value for them because they could just glance at it. They don't have to like look through lines and lines to see like all of the details to see what the overall book of business is doing. So it's, it's thinking about not just what they want, but why they want what they want. And then how can you help execute on that? Because we see it with our product teams today so much. It's a, uh, Oh, Yes, if you want to get to that report, you click this button and this button and this button and this button. It's like, great. Did you know that 80% of our customers actually want this report? Why is it so hard to get to? And yeah. it's, it's bringing that down and bringing that truth in and, and not getting too married to what you build. It, it's a great point. And the, the way I think about these things is they don't become ingrained into the culture of how a team works until there's a cadence of, of accountability is what I call it. And I yeah. didn't make that up, but that, that, and so what I like to do when we deploy these kind of systems and tools within the companies that we're working with or, you know, whatever is there's gotta be a metric, right? There's gotta be an activity. Mm -hmm. The team's gotta be trained on that activity. And then the managers, not, not you, cause you're in operations trying to try and enable people, but the managers have to care about the thing enough happening, whatever the process is, let's say it's, you know, updating your risk, profile on your, on your accounts on a, on a monthly basis or a biweekly basis, there should be some kind of forum where information is reviewed and it, because it's important to the business. And if you show up to that yeah. meeting without having your updates done, it's going to be obvious, right? And ahead of the yeah. management team can look across their team and say, okay, you know, you five guys haven't done your updates this week and the other eight have, right? So um, like, let's get that up to date. So I think there's gotta be this cadence of accountability and it's really, what are the things we actually have to do to, um, you know, to run the business and, and how do we get, yeah. create, you know, the, the processes and tools around that? I don't know if, you, yeah. if you've had to use, use the same technique or if that's ever play at Conversica, but we see it a lot. It's, it's a day-to-day -day struggle. It really is. Um, the accountability piece has been one of the hardest components because I can only poke and prod and coach and educate so much. It does come down to the managers to ensure that the right level of value is being placed on the different activities. And we're lucky. We're growing really quickly. We're getting new managers um, 
rather relic like rather quickly like we're expanding out our, our csm roles our teams um so we have more new people who haven't done it before and that's yeah. actually been one of the best catalysts to getting the systems to be used more like more regularly because they crave that visibility they crave that insight they didn't they were csms when they were doing it they weren't necessarily doing a great job they didn't really quite understand why it was important because the the manager that they had on the time was doing so much they couldn't actually apply themselves to helping to build in the what did you call it the the cadence of accountability the cadence of accountability i love it so much yes so they didn't really have the opportunity to build that in because they were so busy but now now they're saying like, oh my gosh, how did they even know what was going on? We didn't. We were just basing right. it off of the things that were escalated. There was a lot of like water flowing under the, and the like subspring, but we didn't know what yeah. was happening. So yeah. it's been a I, huge I, benefit having those new people actually. And I would recommend that. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Like I, I wonder how much of this stems from, and I'm not saying this is where Kaversky is, but we see a lot of teams that are like this. It's it, a customer success team, but they're the, the, for that team are really sort of muggy, right? It's not clear mm -hmm. why they exist, what metric they're after. Because if it was clear, like, you know, hey, we we have, you know, <laughs> we have $10 million worth of renewals to go get this year. And that's our number one thing. And, you know, here are the five leading activities that, that roll into getting that done. We're going to measure the heck out of them. We're going to drive the team to go do then you wouldn't be having conversations maybe around, you know, fantasy football, right? You 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 know what your job is and there's there's accountability around it and you go, go, go. But you know, yeah. maybe I'm oversimplifying it. No, I, I think that you're in the ideal world. You're a hundred percent accurate. Uh, I think that there's a lot of squirrel opportunities or moments though, yeah. where <laughs> it's like, Oh, Whoa, like this one thing really took us for a loop. All of a sudden, only everyone on the team is distracted by focusing on this one thing. And, and you kind of lose sight of those five key priorities. Um, yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons why we actually implemented out our new approach for onboarding is because we saw that the CSMs were getting pulled into far too many tactical conversations instead of focusing on the strategy and the value add that we wanted to kind of right fit it and just reset the CSMs relationship with customers from the get go. So there would be less of that because we actually we would have we would have multiple people on a call with a customer that really only one person needed to be on the call. And that's just taking the time up from us being able to support another customer. So it's, it has been interesting and you're right. Like you would think that if you had your five things in a row, it'd be really easy to stay focused, but unfortunately things do come up, whether it's, yeah. you know, an executive priority or a large customer need that wasn't considered that all of a sudden it becomes the most important customer need. Um, and then everyone has to adjust and adapt to it is a, unique role or if marketing has an event that they want to launch and push and you will have to reach out to all of your customers. <laughs> that never happens yep. less than it. No, yeah, no, 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 no. no. I think one of the, we've talked a lot about just, I guess the change management and communicating down, right. But to the managers or communicating um, into, you know, I guess horizontally into some of the organizations or into the CSMs, but how also do you think about uh, the change management to the executive level? You know, how do you think about your peers, um, on the executive team and, and what you're, you know, communicating with them. And also like, how do you look at kind of your reporting output or even just their metrics and reporting, you know, dashboards, how does that really impact um, what you're doing at the executive level as well? So for the, for the executive level relationships, whatnot, um, I'm pretty fortunate in the sense that we have really strong C level leadership who they really do work well together and they are in pretty much alignment on most functions of everything. So, so when we roll things out, we can roll it out direct to the users and the adoption of it does go out pretty well. I think that a lot of the things that I was talking about earlier today were more historical. Um, we have a really solid executive team now. Um, we always did different world. Now we're more operational focused. Um, so that has been really easy in the sense that our whole customer success department and organization is in alignment, which allows our CCO to be able to go in and talk to this other C levels and other VPs and say, Hey, this is kind of what we're focusing on. These are what our needs are. And it will kind of like trickle down because there is an alignment in the room. 
Um, it allows us to then reach out to sales when we're launching a new process because they, they heard that it was going to be coming through and that they should be paying attention to it. In regards to the metrics and to the benchmarks and kind of how we think about those different dashboards, uh, we primarily have our dashboards for our customer success teams. Uh, we have built out some reports and some dashboards for our marketing teams and our product teams for different events. So like we built out a process that says, hey, if a customer is in a healthy point and you think that they'd be a good reference, log them into the system so that way they can show up in sales's report and then even marketing's report. Um, if you think that they would be prime for a case study because you've gotten a level of value add, make sure that you log it and update it so they can get an alert and they can decide if they want to do a case study on it. And we have dashboards built out in Salesforce for those, which is really nice. Um, and they use it a little bit, but we also do a lot of email communication about, hey, this is a customer win. And then that will prompt the action on their side. So I think that there's some room that we can improve on that front. Um, with our product teams, the dashboards and the systems, they actually are using the product that we purchased for usage. So we own and we manage our on-site application that lets us know how people are interacting with our system, what they're using, what features they're using. We manage all of the push communications in there. So if you're ever logged into Converska and if you see a pop-up, this is within the dashboard itself. Um, after you become a customer, you see a pop-up that says, hey, did you know this feature is new? Um, that's something that customer success ops owns, but they use those reporting and they use that system and they understand how customers are using it to help make their own decisions. So that's something that's been relatively new for us and we're really excited about it. And it's helping us get more alignment from the customer side to the product side. I don't know if that addressed your question. I feel like I just went down like a ramble. <laughs> no, that's, that's a very cool thing. Though. Yeah, I know it, it does. It's, um, I think, you know, more so just, just learning that there is, I think just the communication down and communication up and you have to think about how you, you know, how that actually happens, you know, it's different. So I think just hearing the nuances is, is, um, is good, but, um, yeah, we'll end there. You know, Jennifer, appreciate all the time you gave to us. We're excited just to continue to, to, you know, be connected with you and hear more about what happened, what's happening at Conversica. So, uh, we're excited with all that you've done and appreciate all the time today. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, thanks so much for taking the time to listen to the Gain, Grow, Retain podcast. If you liked what you heard, please take a moment and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues and subscribe. We really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. <laughs>